The following is an interview that I conducted recently with Joe Smid. You can find Joe on a variety of different platforms, including his YouTube channel, The Majesty of Reason. On this channel, Joe covers a variety of different topics within the area of philosophy, including introductions to critical thinking, how to analyze arguments, and some more detailed analysis of the philosophical topics that Joe is interested in. You can also find more about Joe on his website, joeschmidt.com, where he has links to his blogs as well as his books and YouTube channel. Lastly, Joe is a wonderful author, and I would highly recommend the two books that he's written. First and foremost is his introduction to critical thinking called The Majesty of Reason that's available on Amazon for purchase. His second book, which is a little bit more academic, existential inertia and classic theistic proofs is also available for purchase on Amazon, but should also be available through your local school library. I hope that you enjoy this video. And if you do, please give it a like and a subscribe. Okay. Hello, everyone. And welcome back. Very interesting guest with me here today, Joe Schmid of the YouTube fame, uh, Majesty of Reason. As well as, uh, well, that's actually not what we're going to be talking about today. Today, I invited Joe on to talk about Joe's book, uh, Existential Inertia and Classic Theistic Proofs. Welcome, Joe. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. And uh, I can point to the book, even it's right there. It's up it's in, my, in my screen. So <laughs> next to little uh, Memento Scully right there, if I can move. Nice. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so exciting, exciting. Good deal. I will link both the YouTube channel and the link to the book in the description of this video. I will also say, let me interrupt you. Yeah, um, yeah, good. Book is very expensive. I had no choice over that. Springer is an academic press. They mainly serve libraries. So it's libraries that are purchasing, like, basically, like, the books. So, uh if you uh, cannot afford it, there are uh, basically just email me and I might be able to help you in certain ways. So um, that's something that, that I can say. Good deal. Yeah. And if you're a college student, especially, you probably will have access to this book through your university's library. So very true. Also, yeah, you can you guys can all, all you just check with your local library. They might they might have it. They might have access to it and you could even download it probably. So. Right. Local libraries are amazing. I can't shout them out enough. Uh, fantastic exactly. resources. So, Joe, um, how about we start off? Uh, just tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do. Yeah. So uh, I what do I do? I mean, I every day I breathe. Uh, no, <laughs> sorry. I am trying to uh, I'm currently um, right now I'm in my gap year and uh, in between graduating from Purdue University, I studied philosophy there and I'm about to be a grad student at Princeton University. I'm going to be getting a PhD. Yeah, I'm going to be getting a PhD in philosophy if all goes well. So very excited for that. Mm. Um, I do both popular and scholarly level work in philosophy. So on the popular level, I've got my YouTube channel, Majesty of Reason, which is like objectively the best YouTube channel that there is. So uh, everyone should immediately go and subscribe and turn on the little bell for notifications like immediately. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then um, I guess on the popular level, I also have a blog by the same name, but that's mainly just for responding to people informally um, who respond to my work. Um, and then on the scholarly level, yeah, I write books and papers and submit them to journals. And when I get referee reports back, I usually scream at my computer because they're so confused. But um, uh, anyway, <laughs> okay, I, sorry, I'm, okay. I'm saying too much. Uh, that is no. that is about me. I do popular and scholarly work in philosophy. And I also am a fan of, of Arsenal. So I've got my Arsenal shirt and all the uh, paraphernalia behind me. Awesome. Awesome. So one of the questions my students always like for me to ask is... Um, why philosophy like what what got you hooked on the philosophy bug i mean you're you're about to be pursuing a phd obviously it's you've invested a lot of time and effort into this what what led you down this path yeah uh very good question i guess i could take that in two ways one is I'm a, one a, one way is a kind of causal historical explanation which is just like what personal factors led me to philosophy and then another one is almost like a kind of normative slash justificatory question like what's the value of philosophy like why do i keep on keep on doing this um so i'll take both of those because i think they're both uh important and interesting well i guess the former isn't really important no one cares about mine no i'm <laughs> kidding okay so yeah about me well uh, i grew up in a uh religious household and uh i went to uh, private Christian schools for grade school and high school even. And um, 
they, I had theology classes basically every day, and that's very close to philosophy of religion. So theology classes, it's the study of God. So we're talking about what is God's nature? What would God be like? What is God's relationship to the world? Uh, how do we know that God exists or quote unquote, know that God exists? You know, that's a question of whether or not God exists that philosophers investigate, right? So yeah, I mean, from a very early age, I was exposed to these sorts of questions and they just totally captivated me. Um, I was just I love thinking about them. And when I got my little iPod touch in like fifth grade or something, I downloaded Instagram, like all the cool kids were doing. And mm -hmm. instead of posting like all the cool kids were doing, I mainly went on to like debate forums and actually had like substantive conversations about topics that I was interested in. And that included mm -hmm. as I, as I um, went through grade school and learned about uh, evolution and things like that, I would um, discuss that. I discuss abortion. I discuss God's existence. Um, and again, it was all actually pretty substantive for some, somehow I got lucky by finding my way into substantive like respectful debate forums not always but very often so uh, you know I don't, I don't know how i did that but i managed um okay so anyway and then all that kind of spiraled into a passion for these topics and for uh the sphere of ideas and in high school i continued to you know discuss with others debate with others question things i questioned a lot of my pre-existent religious beliefs and then that took me straight into philosophy of religion and there was no going back from there. And then later on, of course, in my philosophical development, I branched away from philosophy of religion. Well, I'm still in philosophy of religion, but I mm -hmm. branched outwards too, doing other things like metaphysics, philosophy of time and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a causal historical side of the question. Now on to the uh, normative slash justificatory, justificatory mm -hmm. side. I, I mean, why, why am I keep on, why do I keep on doing this? There are lots of reasons. I mean, one thing is just like it provides a lot of enjoyment uh, mm. for me and others. I think it's intrinsically fast, like intrinsically interesting, intrinsically fascinating, just studying the fundamental nature of reality, studying what explains what, studying how we know things, studying whether or not uh, deference to uh, scientific or political authorities is reliable or justified or what have you, studying um, political theory and what makes for a good society, what makes for a just society, and so on. So all these questions I just find so fascinating. And uh, I think they're just intrinsically interesting and oftentimes very important. They have ramifications. Like mm. uh, there are ramifications about whether or not we should prefer like liberty over equality or whether or not like we can curb liberty for the sake of greater security and things like that. These are normative yeah. philosophical questions that ethicists debate. So uh, very important, very important stuff. Um, so importance is one, intrinsic enjoyment is one, intrinsic fascination is one. Also. Philosophy is just really good at helping you think critically and detect bullshit. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, you're you're basically the, the more you study philosophy, the the more attuned you are to find distinctions. You can spot fallacies in other people's reasoning. You're not, uh, you know, you're able to kind of dissect arguments and pick apart issues with with much greater precision and clarity and rigor. And that's a powerful tool in life. Uh, there's that. There's a reason why philosophy majors tend to outcompete lots of other majors when it comes to the GRE and the LSAT and various mm -hmm. other things. It's because you're honing their critical thinking skills. So critical thinking is another benefit. So th I mean, there are lots more. I could go on for ages, but you know, we need to <laughs> we, we need to stop <laughs> at some point. So. No, that's great. You're you're probably the first person I've heard say that internet debate forums led you to led you to philosophy. But uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whatever got you there, I suppose. I mean, that's that's interesting. Um, great. Well, no, thank you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the book. And I'm I've been trying to think about the best way to approach this within the time frame that we have. So it it seems to me that we got um, for those of you who don't know, there are different uh, branches. Um, different disciplines within philosophy. Uh, Joe's already mentioned quite a few um, philosophy of religion, metaphysics, philosophy of time. It it seems like the book and what your the existential inertia, the, the thesis, the idea that you're primarily interested in is kind of a mixture of all those two. So how would you explain it, what you're researching and write about to somebody that may not be super familiar with philosophical jargon and lingo wow uh yeah wow uh that's difficult um usually usually i say do you really want to know uh <laughs> <laughs> usually that's usually that's the first thing i say and if they say yes and i'm like okay well then i'll explain it as best as i can um <laughs> so anyway i give them caveats it's like do you really want to hear this uh yeah. but anyway yeah i mean it's heady stuff it's difficult it's yeah. uh 
you know, it's very technical philosophy. We use even technical tools of mathematics and science in there. Um, so, yeah, anyway, just wanted to say that up front um, so that people don't come in thinking like, I, you will probably need a background in philosophy to get the most out of this yeah. book. So just wanted to say that. Okay, anyway, back to your question. Here's what I tell people who are not within the field of philosophy and what, what I research and what this book is about. One of the main things the book is about is ex what explains why things continue to exist. So we look around us and there are lots of different things. There's a laptop here. There's like a, an organism right here. Uh, there's like a, a cup up there. Hmm. There's a scarf right there. Okay. There are lots of things around us. Right. <laughs> and we tend to think that, yeah, that these things continue to exist through time. Right. So mm -hmm. one second is going by another second is going by another second is going by. It's all still there. Right. I mean, I'm still here. Right. So we're persisting in existence. We are continuing to exist moment by moment. So that's that's what I mean by persistence. Things are continuing to exist over time. They're remaining the same thing. Of course, they can gain the least properties, but they persist throughout that process. The prop some of their properties don't, but they as objects do. OK, and then we have a question. What explains that? Why do things persist in existence? What explains that? I mean, is it just like some brute inexplicable fact of reality uh, that just, you know, things just do? End of story. I mean, that's not very, that's not very satisfying. Uh, so I mean, like, why do things persist? It's an interesting question. And that's really what I'm exploring in the book. Some people say, hey, in order to explain why things persist, in order to explain why they continue to exist, moment by moment by moment, you have to appeal to something like a timeless God, which continuously mm. sustains them in existence, which kind of keeps them from lapsing into non-being, as it were. Mm. So that's one kind of answer. Um, and, and that's the kind of classical theistic proofs that we're talking about. Classical theism is a particular view of God on which God is like timeless and immutable. He has all these fascinating properties. Mm. Um, and various people try to prove God's existence by saying, hey, you can't explain persistence unless you posit this sort of God. That's the basic idea. And what we're doing is we're responding to that sort of argument. We're saying, uh, no, there are lots of other ways to explain persistence. Uh, and we develop different ways of explaining persistence within the model of existential inertia. So existential inertia is just a thesis. It's a description, a purported description of the way or manner in which things continue to exist. And it basically says that, hey, at least some things within time. So maybe it's just the fundamental things. Maybe it's just the fundamental particles or fundamental waves or whatever. Uh, just the itty bitty things at the kind of ground layer of reality, as it were. Or maybe it's everything in time. But at least some temporal things continue to exist without being sustained, continuously kept in existence by something outside of them. And they only cease to exist when something like kind of destroys them, basically. So that's the basic thesis. Now, that in and of itself doesn't provide an explanation of persistence. We go on to explore various different explanations that are compatible with existential inertia for why things persist. And you can kind of see how that responds to the kind of classical theistic proofs that I mentioned earlier, right? Because those proofs say, hey, you can't explain persistence unless you posit this sort of God. But... What we do in the book is we say, hey, actually, there are lots of these different explanations of persistence that are totally compatible with existential inertia. And under existential inertia, things aren't continuously sustained in existence by a being like that. So, um, so no, it's actually not the case that you need a timeless God to continuously sustain things. Each moment of their existence kind of continually granting them being uh, in order for them to persist. Mm. So that's that's the elevator. I mean, it, it was a little bit. That's a long elevator ride, but uh, yeah. that's the elevator pitch. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that's fantastic. So we've got the philosophy of time bit with this uh, notion of persistence, which mm -hmm. uh, I, I do want to ask you about. We'll come back to it here in a second. And then there's this, this other bit that you're responding to, which are uh, proofs coming from classic theism, classical theism. Now, that might, you mean a very specific sort of theism, that we're we're talking about here that might be a little bit confusing to people that may not know that there are different i mean everybody probably knows what theism is maybe people aren't as familiar with classic theism and in, in the specific sorts of arguments that are put forward in classic theism so can you give us a bird's eye view of of what classic theism is on the one hand and what are the common sorts of maybe the big classic theistic philosophers and the the kind of basic arguments that they're putting forward here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's start out broad. Uh, theism. Theism, roughly speaking, is, is like a thesis. It's a claim. It's a view. It's the claim that 
some god or gods exist. Okay, that's the basic that's the basic thrust. Some god or gods exist. Now, we're we're focusing in particular on monotheism. So classical theism is a version of monotheism, and monotheism is a version of theism. Okay, so monotheism says there's exactly one god. And classical theism is a particular version of monotheism. Okay. Now, it's actually I mean I I'm saying a version here, but as people in the literature like to think of it, it's basically like a model of God. It's a way of modeling or picturing or viewing God. Not only God's nature, not only like God's nature or his character, how he is, but also how he relates to the world. So it's a kind of like a kind of picture of God and what God is like and how God relates to the world. It's a model, a theory of God, as it were. Okay. So classical theism is a particular theory of God or a particular model of God. There are other models of God, but Classical theism shares in common with most different models of God a kind of core. And that core is like a lot of the standard claims that here almost all theists ascribe to God. God is perfectly good. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. God is the creator of every, uh, basically everything around us. <laughs> God's the creator of all that. Everything apart from God, we could say. Um, God is perfectly just. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, there are lots of these core, kind of, God is just perfect, simpliciter. So that's a kind of core notion or core conception of God that's common to a lot of different models of God. That's basically like, that's what theists believe in for the most part, or at least traditional monotheists. Mm -hmm. Classical theism goes on to add some distinctive claims to that core. And they're distinctive claims, which distinguish classical theism from other models of God. There are, there are many, but uh, four prominent ones are, firstly, they affirm divine timelessness. They say God exists outside of time. God is not a temporal being. God does not undergo succession. There, there aren't like succession to his thoughts or his actions. He doesn't do one thing and then another. He doesn't experience one thing and then another. He just exists in this kind of timeless now, which is like purely static, as it were, uh, and just totally timeless. So no succession, no temporal location. Okay, that's timelessness. That's the first kind of thesis that they add on to that core. The second thesis that classical theists add on to that core is immutability. And this, you can see how it is closely tied to timelessness. If something mm -hmm. is timeless, well, then you might think plausibly, it can't then change, right? If it changed, if it went from being one way to being another way, well, then it, it would have to be that other way later, right? It would have to, it'd have to be in time. So some people think, or so is plausible, one might think. Uh, and so if it's timeless, it has to be immutable. It can't change in any way. It can't like gain properties. It can't lose properties. Uh, and so God's immutable. And us also, they say that God's immutable in an even stronger sense. Not only that he can't gain or lose properties, but he also can't vary across worlds. So mm. philosophers talk about different possible worlds. There's just different ways that reality could have been. So no matter what way that reality could have been, God would have had all the same intrinsic features or God in and of himself would have had all the same features. He might have connected up differently to different things in different worlds. But as he is in himself, his intrinsic features, they're all the same across all possible worlds. So that's immutability. It's got time assist and immutability. The third thing that classical theists add on to that core is divine simplicity. Mm. Divine simplicity says that God has no parts whatsoever. He is a totally simple being. And what that means is that everything intrinsic to him, everything inside of him is numerically identical to him. So all of his features that, are, that characterize him as he is in himself, they're actually identical to him. So God is identical to his omnipotence. He's identical to his omniscience. He's identical to his goodness. All these are identical to God and identical to each other, consequently. So this is why sometimes you'll hear classical theists say like, oh, God is like goodness itself or like being itself and other such phrases. Okay, uh, so that's divine simplicity. Uh, everything intrinsic to God is identical to God. He has no parts, whether physical or metaphysical. Metaphysical parts are like just like distinct properties. Hmm. Okay. So that's divine simplicity. And then the fourth thing that classical theists add on to classical theism is divine impassibility. Divine impassibility basically says, I mean, a number of things. Firstly, God doesn't have like passions. So he's not like affected or moved by things emotionally. Um, that's not to say that he doesn't have any kind of like valenced quasi emotional states. It's just that the valenced quasi emotional states aren't like affected by anything outside of God or anything like that. These, mm -hmm. they're just like kind of perfectly self-sufficient, perfectly happy, perfectly fulfilled in and of himself. Um, so he can't suffer, he can't experience negative emotions, and uh, he also can't be affected by anything outside of him. Hmm. Okay, so that's what impassibility says. And then, uh, so those are the four core, like, 
I shouldn't say core. Those are the four distinctive kind of attributes that classical theists attribute to God. I mean, they're all like identical to one another and to God himself under the classical theistic view. Um, but yeah, they add those claims to the core conception of God. So again, they they grant that God's omnipotent and perfect and omniscient and perfectly rational and free and creator of everything else, etc. Mm -hmm. But they go on to add those those theses. Okay, so that's that's what classical theism is. Again, it's just a model of God. Okay, what are some prominent classical theists? Well, there are some divergences in the way that they flesh out some of these characteristics of God, uh, but, you know, it's it's roughly speaking what unifies the classical theistic tradition, which spans back, some people argue, to like Plato and Aristotle. It's a bit mm -hmm. of a stretch, but uh, anyway, some like people who are like really like paradigmatic classical theists are people like Aquinas mm -hmm. or Augustine, Boethius, mm -hmm. Lombard, Maimonides, Avicenna, Okay, these sorts of people. <laughs> so that's, and then I guess that's the traditional, and then more um, in the contemporary sphere, it'll be things like, well, I mean, there, there are lots of different people who you could name, like Catherine Rogers and Ed Fazer and Brian Kerr and et cetera. Okay. So those are some people. And then some arguments for this view. Well, one argument that people try to say is, hey, you can't explain. It's like the kind of broad classical theistic proof that I mentioned earlier that, uh, that appeals to persistence. They say, hey, things are like continuing to exist throughout time. Uh, mm -hmm. And the basic idea is that like, you can't explain their moment by moment existence. You can't explain their, their existence at each moment of their lives unless you appeal to some kind of timeless sustaining cause that keep, continuously keeps them in being and prevents them from lapsing into non-being, as it were. Um, and they try to argue that this timeless first cause uh, would have various divine attributes uh, mm -hmm. associated with the classical theistic God. So that's one kind of argument. Uh, it would basically be like, hey, things continue to exist through time. Secondly, that has an explanation. Thirdly, you can't explain that without the, uh, the classical theistic God. Therefore, the classical theistic God exists. Something like that. Gotcha. Um, very, I'm painting with very broad brushstrokes, people. So, right, right, you know, right. I'm just trying to trying to convey it. Okay, so that's one sort of argument, and there are actually a bunch of different variations on that that we uh, discuss in the book. Ad, ad, you know, ad nauseum almost. So, yeah. um, And then a different kind of argument, a different kind of classical theistic proof that we look at in the book appeals to abstract objects. So what are abstract objects? They're things like numbers and sets and properties and uh, propositions and etc. Now these are technical philosophical terms, but they're, they're these sorts of they're like mathematical entities. So like sets, numbers, etc., functions. Uh, they're kind of like almost like uh, almost spooky sorts of things. They're like non-causal. You know, you don't see the number two cooking a sandwich or anything like that. You don't see functions cause things. Uh, so they're like non-causal things, and we might typically think of them as like non spatial temporal. Again, like it's not like the number two is in my garage, or if I like write the number two up on that board, that's just a that's a numeral. That's not a number. A numeral is like a physical scratchings which represent the number. That's not the number. You don't destroy the number two by erasing all the numerals <laughs> in the world. So uh, two plus two would still equal four, uh, even if you erase all the numerals, and even if there were no physical things. So one might think that um, there are these non-physical uh, necessarily existing, you know, because it's not like the number two could like somehow go out of existence or, or even fail to exist, right? Two plus two is necessarily four. In order for that to be the case, you have to have two there and you have to have the plus function. You have to have two. So if they're four, so like these things are necessarily existent. They're non-physical. They're, uh, they're non-spatial temporal. You're not going to knock up into them in, in the space-time world. Uh, and that's what philosophers call abstract objects. Hmm. Okay. So they give various arguments for the existence of abstract objects. And then secondly, they say, uh, well, you could either you could either say that these abstract objects just kind of exist out there without residing in a mind, or you could say that they reside in a mind. They're kind of like ideas within the, a mind of an infinite intellect. Uh, and then they say, well, hey, that first option has various problems uh, that they think afflict it. So, for instance, if they just if they don't reside in a mind, it, it becomes kind of weird how these things have various properties associated with minds. So, like. Um, propositions, which are abstract objects. They're like the meanings of declarative sentences. They have a kind of representational character. They represent the world as being certain ways. And that's paradigmatic of minds. So they have very suspiciously mind-like features. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you might think that uh, positing a kind of non-spatial temporal infinite intellect, which in which reside all, this infinite realm of abstracta, um, you might think that that explains various features of the abstract landscape very well. Uh, and also, you might think that that provides a really nice explanation of how we can come to know these things, right? Like, if there isn't a mind that can kind of ensure a correspondence between us and those things, 
uh, well then, you know, how, how do we kind of cognitively latch onto them? I mean, they're just these like non-causal, th they don't have any causal effects on us. So like, how could we come to grasp them and, and know things about them if there, if there isn't a kind of intermediary, like uh, some sort of, I don't know, divine mind that kind of crafts us in a way that we can latch onto them. Um, okay. So then the, 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 this basic thrust of this argument would be like, hey, firstly, there are abstract objects like numbers, propositions, sets, et cetera. Secondly, those uh, abstract objects are either like they exist outside of a mind, but they, yeah, so they either exist outside of a mind or they exist as thoughts and ideas in the mind. Hmm. Thirdly, they do not exist outside of that mind because that has various problems. Therefore, they exist within within a mind. And that mind has to be like infinite because, you know, there are infinitely many numbers and so on. So we get this infinite intellect, which is timeless and spaceless and necessarily existent. And that sounds a lot like God, you might think. Hmm. Okay, so the, the, that's the two broad families of classical theistic proofs that we examine in the book. Again, they're proofs in the sense that they're trying, attempting to prove God's existence. I mean, they don't work, right. but <laughs> they're, they're attempting. <laughs> they're attempting to do so. So, um, okay. I know that was a long answer, but I yeah. hope it was uh, edifying. No, no, that's, that's fantastic. Um, and I'm glad you made that distinction. And I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to form this question because it's a question I've had now – Granted, a, a little bit of disclaimer here. It's it's been quite a while since I read any Aquinas or classical theist. I, I mean, I think the I took a class on Aquinas in grad school, but it was a better part of a decade ago. So um, it's been quite a minute. And reading through the the article of yours that I had, and reading through the selections of the book, it's it's drawing in a little bit of this. So you outlined kind of the basic features of classical theism, kind of what it adds to this notion of God. Uh, one and two, you said uh, divine timelessness, um, you know, God exists outside of time. And this kind of relates to this, the, the first kind of kind of category of argument that you put forward. And on the one hand that like, I can kind of understand that in the sense that if there's this notion, I think, within classical theism, you correct me if I'm wrong, that, you know, God as a, as a necessary being doesn't require a cause for his own existence, right? Um, and, you know, if we're going to say, like, God exists outside of time and there's no change in God, like, okay, like, sure, like, I, I can I could go along with that. Um, I guess what's confusing me is where does this, like, sustaining idea come into play so this is for like contingent beings right so beings that are born and die so what this might sound like a dumb question i guess but under that like model like why do contingent beings need to be sustained and then maybe from there we can kind of transition into existential inertia. <laughs> That's my question. Why do they need to be sustained? Why not accept existential inertia? <laughs> okay. I mean, okay. um, no, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, yeah. good point. That is my fundamental challenge. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it didn't like originate with me. I'm so, I mean, a lot of, I mean, okay, let me step back. I'm getting too excited. <clears throat> so, yes, I think that is a good question to ask. Why do like contingent things, why do temporal things, why do composite things, why do these things need some kind of sustaining uh, cause for their existence, which is outside of them and kind of which continuously keeps them in being? Let's take an analogy. Uh, think about like spatial motion and things maintaining their rectilinear motion. Um, plausibly, uh, <laughs> we have this law of inertia, right? This is where the idea of existential inertia comes from. It's like um, spatial inertia or Newtonian or mechanical inertia. It's an analogy, right? So think about that case. The basic idea behind kind of like Newtonian inertia is that physical things continue in their rectilinear motion without needing some kind of continual impetus, without needing some kind of continual force pushing them along. No, they just continue right. in their rectilinear motion unless and until some net force acts upon them to take them off that rectilinear motion. That is total, that's totally structurally identical to the existential inertia thesis. Hmm. That thesis says not, not, not that things continue in the rectilinear motion, but they just continue to exist without needing some kind of continual impetus, as in the case of Newtonian inertia. They don't need some kind of continual outside sustaining cause, which kind of keeps them in being at each moment. And unless and until they're destroyed, right? So that's like the net force acting upon them. So mm -hmm. it, there's an, an, an analogy there, which can help, I guess, pedagogically. But uh, as to your question, why do things require... Uh, 
a sustaining cause. I mean, one idea is like, hey, there is this principle called the principle of sufficient reason. And it says mm. that every contingent fact, maybe even every fact, uh, that's a particularly striking claim, every single fact whatsoever. Um, but at least every contingent fact requires an explanation. And so long as, like, we're contingent things, it's a contingent fact that we exist at any given moment, say. And so, per this principle, which they say is supported, like, intuitively, like, it seems intuitively plausible that contingent facts require an explanation. I mean, after all, if it's a contingent fact, it genuinely could have failed to obtain. So then if it does obtain, there's a kind of mystery as to why it obtains. It seems like there needs to be an accounting. There needs to be an explanation of why it obtains. Because it genuinely could have failed to obtain. So um, it's kind of intuitively plausible. Also, we look around us and it's like abundantly empirically confirmed. Like every time we see, we come across contingent facts, they have explanations. And science mm -hmm. seems to, I mean, science seems to kind of rest on uh, this kind of search for explanations and thinking that explanations are there to be found, even if we haven't yet found them. Um, like no one would take seriously that uh, like a murder just inexplicably happened. Like obviously it has an explanation. Um, so people try to motivate this principle of sufficient reason and say, hey, contingent facts require an explanation. And moreover, it's a contingent fact that any given contingent thing persists and exists at any given moment of its existence. And hence, that requires an explanation. And it requires an explanation, not just for its origination, but also at each and every single moment that it persists, right? Because that is also a contingent fact that it exists at that particular moment. So mm -hmm. that requires an explanation. And they're trying, what they're going to want to say is like, well, uh, you could cite another contingent thing, but the same question arises with respect to that thing to explain it, right? It's like, why does that thing exist at that particular moment? Uh, you could try to cite another contingent thing, uh, but you can see where we're going. Uh, I mean, so they're going to try to say, like, you can't have an infinite descending chain of contingent things right. sustaining other contingent things. And so you must get to a kind of necessary sustaining cause of contingent things. Um, so anyway, that's, that's part of their idea. Mm. Now, you know, I can't just leave that hanging. I have to respond. So, um, <laughs> so uh, you know, I'm willing to grant at least arguendo that every contingent fact requires an explanation. I'm certainly not willing to grant that every fact requires an explanation. I, I think that, mm. I think that's no, because um, I think explanation is uh, irreflexive and uh, basically that that's going to get you into a, a, a trilemma where either explanations descend infinitely, which it, this argument is already granting we can't have that right so because mm -hmm. remember we ruled out those infinitely descending chains of explanation so either explanation descends infinitely which they're they're wanting to rule out or it loops back on itself and i think that's absurd because then something is kind of indirectly explaining itself it's like pulling itself up by its own bootstraps it would already have to be there <laughs> in order to explain itself so um i don't think that works and so then what that means is that it's inevitable that you just have a linear chain and you get to some bottom thing which doesn't have an explanation okay so i reject that everything has an explanation but in principle, I'm okay with uh, every contingent thing having a, every contingent fact having an explanation. And what I want to say is they had a little sly move in there, and I kind of made it very implicit. I kind of uh, snuck mm -hmm. it in there. But it's the idea that the only way that you can explain the the momentary existence at a given moment of a contingent thing is by appeal to an outside sustaining cause. Mm -hmm. That's false. No, that's false. There are lots of other explanations that you can cite which don't appeal to an outside sustaining cause, even of the existence at non-first moments of something's existence. You can appeal to like cross-temporal causal relations that 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 relate the successive stages of the of the object itself. Uh, you can appeal to cross-temporal causal relations. That's that's what I, I just said. Secondly, you can appeal to like uh, certain dispositions and tendencies of things, or perhaps the lack of dispositions and tendencies of things. We talk about that in the book. We talk, I mean, I talk, we talk about all this in the book. Uh, you can appeal to um, so many different factors um, uh, that, that don't require an outside sustaining cause. So I think there's a sly premise in there that uh, I left out. And once you make it explicit, you can see that it has a false premise, which is that the only way to explain the existence of something at a, at a given moment, the, the only way to explain the existence of a contingent thing at a given moment is by appeal to an outside sustaining cause and that ain't that ain't true hmm. okay so the argument rests their argument if i can kind of recap see where you let me just from there. You let me ahead. just say before you go i'm speaking in very broad brushstrokes i know i already said that right. but you know i'm just giving a kind of abstract form of the kind of classical of the first sort of classical theistic argument that i articulated right um, the first sort was like tracing down explanations to a timeless sustaining cause. And then the other one was like the abstract thing. Okay. So I'm just giving the abstract form of the kind of uh, first 
type of classical theistic argument. Uh, and I'm just trying to give people a sense of how one might motivate the abstract form by appeal to, for instance, the PSR. So just wanted to put a caveat there. No, no, no. That's, that's great. Thank you. So let's talk about how your understanding of persistence, I don't want to say challenges that, doesn't make the same sort of assumptions, refutes that maybe, however you want to phrase that. So you're coming at this from a different angle with the existential inertia thesis. Now, how does, how does what you're saying um, undermine this notion of causation that they're using? Maybe causation is not the right word there. Their, their understanding of time that's being employed within the argument. Yeah. Yeah, so these arguments are basically pinpointing some feature, or I guess not feature, they're pinpointing some kind of object. We call these persistence arguments. So the persistence arguments, they're pinpointing some uh, kind of thing, like a temporal thing, or a contingent thing, or a composite thing, or something like that. They, they say that, hey, there's this kind of thing. Secondly, that kind of thing, in order for it to continue to exist, in order for it to exist at any given moment, it requires an outside sustaining cause, there can't be infinitely descending chains of sustaining causes. And so then you get to a kind of first cause, which can't be of that kind, right? Because everything of that kind requires an outside sustaining cause. And we just concluded to a first cause, which doesn't have that outside sustaining cause. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that that first thing is not of that kind. And so if you argue that temporal things are like that and uh, composite things like that and contingent things are like that, you get to a kind of first cause, which is timeless non-composite or absolutely simple remember divine simplicity uh, mm. and it's um necessarily existent etc um so that's the abstract form of their argument and, and you can kind of see how then once you put the abstract form of their argument existential inertia would challenge that if it were true so existential inertia of course challenges that that kind of, i think it was the second step in there the first step was saying hey there are entities of this certain kind secondly entities of that kind require a certain kind of external sustenance thirdly that external sustenance can't descend infinitely and so you get the conclusion that there's a kind of first cause which doesn't have that, or which isn't of that kind. Um, now it's that second step which existential inertia challenges. It's saying uh, if existential inertia is true, no, that's not true of every temporal, every excuse me, that's not true. Their second premise is not true of every temporal thing. Is not true of every contingent thing. Is not true of every um, composite thing. According to the existential inertia thesis, at least some temporal things and so some composite things and so some contingent things within time do not require sustenance in that manner. They persist without requiring sustenance in that manner. And, uh, and yeah, they cease to exist when they're destroyed. So existential inertia directly challenges that second step of their arguments. Now, there are two ways you can put the challenge. One way is just to say, hey, here's an alternative to that here, here's an alternative to, to your second premise. If this alternative were true, your second premise would be false. Okay. And so in order to motivate your second premise, you'd have to rule out this alternative, right? You'd have to give me some reason to think that doesn't obtain, but Hey, you proponents of the argument haven't given me su a sufficient reason for doing that. Okay. So that's one way to go. What philosophers say is that that's kind of like an undercutting defeater way to go. You'd basically say, Hey, that second premise is assuming the falsity of existential inertia. Um, so you need some reason to think existential inertia is false. The thesis is false or some reason to think that that thesis their second premise is true in order for their argument to succeed in order for it to go through uh and then you try to say hey you haven't given a good enough reason to reject existential inertia and you haven't given a good enough reason to accept that premise hmm. so that's one way you could go you could just say hey existential inertia is like an alternative here and in order for your argument to succeed you'd have to rule it out and the reasons that you've given for that premise don't rule it out <laughs> you, hmm. you basically say that um, and so that doesn't require you to positively justify the thesis of existential inertia. You could just say, hey, the proponents of this argument haven't made their case. Uh, end of story, right? They're the ones trying to trying to convince us all to accept the existence of the God of classical theism. The, so the burden of proof is on them to establish God's existence. So that's one way you could go. Uh, you could just say, hey, uh, that second premise isn't adequately justified because here's the thesis um, and you haven't ruled it out. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's not like a facially absurd. It's, you know, I'm not just speaking gibberish. I'm not saying like uh, there is there is both. Uh, something is both square and circle at one and the same time. And in the same respect, like, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> like this thesis is, uh, you know, at least, at least in, to me, it seems at least prima facie plausible actually intuitively. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when I speak with people, uh, 
in my philosophical circles, they're like, wait, Joe, there's actually like a debate about this thesis. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they're like, oh, wait, like, I just assumed that like commonsensically, like obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, not, not everyone is like that. I'm not making an empirical claim that everyone is like that. I'm just pointing <laughs> out that I'm just pointing out that this thesis is not absurd. Right. So it's not like I'm saying, well, right. hey, uh, you could be a brain in a vat. So like, you know, you need to rule, <laughs> you need to rule that out to run your argument. I'm not saying that. Right. I'm not. Right. I'm giving like a live alternative that they would have to rule out in which they don't succeed in doing so. That's all, the, that's all the kind of undercutting defeater approach. Another approach is to give a rebutting defeater, which is actually giving some positive reason to think a premise in the argument is false. Hmm. And since one of their premises conflicts with existential inertia, you know, their premise is basically just denying existential inertia. If I give some reason to think existential inertia is true, then I've given reason to think that their premise is false. And so then that's another way you could go for the criticism. You could just give reasons to think existential inertia is true. Um, what are some reasons to think that, that it's true? Well, um, firstly, there are lots of explanations for persistence that don't require you to posit this additional kind of thing within your ontology, namely like a timeless God. <laughs> so it's far, far simpler, in my view, to have an existential inertialist view. You're not positing this totally new kind of thing. You're not positing a totally new kind of sustaining relation that, that obtains between the things of our experience and that thing and so on. So the existential inertia view is far simpler. And if it can explain the data of persistence just as well, which I argue in the book that it can, because there are lots of different existential inertia friendly explanations of persistence, that is, explanations of why things persist, which are compatible with existential inertia, well, then we should side with existential inertia because it's simpler and explains the data just as well, mm. uh, at least as well. Um, so, okay, that, that's the basic. I mean, there are lots of other arguments for it that we go through in the book. But um, anyway, yeah. so those are the two different approaches that one could take. So again, I don't need, even if that argument fails, okay, cool, it fails. I don't care. Uh, we got the undercutting defeater approach as well, uh, which gotcha. is just saying they haven't made their case. So... You kind of mentioned this in your response there. I, I'm wondering um, how much is at stake here with the existential inertia thesis, like for the classical theist specifically. Like, so if you're right, um, would it simply mean that classic theistic proofs of this variety are incorrect? Or would it mean that there's something, I guess, bigger picture, that there's something wrong with classical theism as a whole like how far down does this does this good go? that's a very very good question um it'll depend on whether or not it depends on what you mean by if i'm right it depends on what you mean because if we're talking about if my undercutting defeater succeeds or if my rebutting defeater succeeds right because there are these two different ways you could put the criticism if the undercutting defeater approach succeeds and that's all that we're saying we're not taking a stance on whether re the rebutting defeater succeeds so in other words okay anyway we're just saying in the undercutting defeater approach that hey they haven't they haven't made their case for this argument and they haven't given sufficient reason to think existential inertia is false um well that's totally compatible with classical theism i mean it could just be like hey okay fine you can't really run persistent these sorts of persistence arguments for classical theism but hey maybe you can run some certain other kind of argument like maybe the kalam or like maybe religious experience or, or whatever okay fine so you can justify classical theism and then that'll kind of get you to a timeless god which creates and sustains things okay um it's just you can't get there by the root of the persistence arguments because they have a premise which is unsupported hmm. um so under that way of going that's totally you know that that criticism is totally compatible with with classical theists i mean with classical theism classical theists themselves can run that against their fellow classical theists who are trying to prove classical theism by means of persistence arguments Okay. You know, classical theists can say, hey, guys, like, actually, th there's this thesis over here, which would render your second premise false. And the thesis isn't, like, obviously absurd, and you haven't given a sufficient reason to rule it out. And they can say, I listen, classical fellow classical theist, uh, I grant that the thesis is false, but I just don't think your argument shows that it's false. And I have these other reasons for classical theism, and then I kind of just indirectly infer that the thesis is false from my classical theism. Uh, but they could still mount the argument. They can mount the thesis as undermining the argument because the argument doesn't give us any reason to rule it out. Um, and so the argument itself wouldn't license one to conclude classical theism. So in that sense, uh, my criticism is, my undercutting defeater criticism at least, is perfectly kosher for classical theists. And it's totally compatible with their, their view and they can even run it themselves against fellow classical theists. Um, the rebutting defeater approach <clears throat> where you're basically saying like, hey, we have really good reasons to think the existential inertia thesis is true. And so we conclude that that it's true and hence that their second premise is false. The second premise of the persistence argument that I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't think the classical theists could accept that. Uh, and, and the reason is because uh, I was a little bit, 
let's see. I was a little bit uh, rough with my sketch of the the four core or not core four distinctive theses that classical yeah. theists add on to um, uh, the core of, of theism. There are other things that they add on too. One of them is the thesis of what W. Matthews Grant calls divine universal causality, hmm. and that's the view that every everything apart from God every reality apart from god so not only every object but like every property apart from god everything that's distinct from god is caused by god and continuously sustained by god at any moment at which it exists mm. that is just core throughout the classical theistic tradition to the point where you're basically i mean you're not really counting as a classical theist if you deny that so <clears throat> what that means then is that the classical theist is committed to dying existential inertia because if existential inertia is true then there are at least some non-god things which, because God is timeless, remember, so existential right. inertia says that some temporal things, so not some non-God things, persist without being sustained by an external reality like God. Um, so the classical theist then, I don't think, could accept existential inertia. And so they couldn't run the rebutting defeater approach to the argument. Um, but they could run the undercutting defeater. And I should note, theists can accept existential inertia. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because they can think that God exists in time. They don't have to go divine timelessness. Um, tons of theists think that God is in time. William Lane Craig, Ryan Mullins, etc. I could go list billions of them. <laughs> Not billions. Okay, that was an exaggeration. <laughs> but I could list many of them. Many, many yeah, theists think yeah. that God exists in time. And if God exists in time, well, hey, guess what? There's a temporal object which mm -hmm. persists in existence without being sustained by anything else namely god himself so they're actually commit they're actually committed to existential inertia um now again um that's because we define existential inertia in a particular way um granted there are other ways of defining existential inertia where, where people say well hey in order for existential inertia to be true like every temporal thing would have to persist without being sustained okay if that's how you're defining ex existential inertia well then uh, these theists who think God is in time would probably have to deny that because they're also probably going to think that God sustains the other things in time, even though God's in time. So they're probably going to deny that form of existential inertia, but that's not the form that I defend. So, uh, mm. and, it, and it's anyway, a little bit TMI there, but, um, anyway, it might uh, be, uh, it might be useful for your audience. So, yeah, yeah, no, that was great. So, uh, Joe, to kind of close us out here, um, I'm would like for you to give us some further readings, recommendations, watching, uh, and maybe we can kind of divide this between the person who has is new to philosophy, has never taken a philosophy class, watched this and said, I understood none of that type of person, who maybe is just interested in critical thinking, maybe, uh, and then maybe somebody that's more so interested in the, the details of your particular argument and learning more about this idea of either classical theism, persistence, existential inertia. Yeah. Well, for the former sort of person, I commend them for their interest, and I think they should go deeper, which is great. Uh, mm -hmm. And what do I recommend they check out? Well, there are lots of different intro courses, intro philosophy courses online. They can watch those for free very often. A lot of them are on YouTube and playlists and so on. Um, those will help. Uh, and they should also read a number of different things, a number of different introductory books. So here's a list. These, these, this isn't in a particular order, but these are going to help the person who wants to get into philosophy and wants to be able to understand these sorts of things. So these will help. Okay. Um, again, no particular order. So um, firstly is the Philosopher's Toolkit by Julian Bagini and I think Peter Fosel. Secondly, the, uh, the Norton Introduction to Philosophy. Mm -hmm. Edited by Gideon Rosen, Alex Byrne, Siana Schifrin, and maybe one or two others. Thirdly, Knowledge, Reality, and Value, A Mostly Common Sense Guide to Philosophy by Michael Humer. Hmm. Um, fourthly, uh, The Majesty of Reason, A Short Guide to Critical Thinking and Philosophy by yours truly. Of course. Um, these are all sorts of, again, these are all like relatively intro books. Relatively. Um, so I recommend checking out all those. Uh, there are also these two giant books that are really helpful. They're called Philosophy 1 and Philosophy 2. You can get them on Amazon. They're ginormous, but they basically are a guide through the subject, and they're written for like undergraduates who are just beginning. So um, this is this is the philosophy two further through the subject. They're edited by AC Grayling. You can get one and two and uh, read them, and they will really help you hone your philosophical skills. Okay, so that's books. Secondly, um, videos. I actually just did a video on my channel 
-hmm. Well, just. I mean, you may be posting this weeks later, but I I recently, semi-recently made a video on my channel called How to Analyze Arguments Like a Philosopher. And <clears throat> that gives that basically teaches you how to analyze arguments like a philosopher. So um, and I I made it pedagogically for, for this sort of person. Mm -hmm. So I recommend checking that out and check out my doing philosophy playlist. It's got a lot of stuff in there about how to write philosophy, how to read philosophy, how to do philosophy, how to think critically, etc. Um, okay, so that's book recommendations and video um, for, for the first sort of person. The second sort of person will naturally enough pick up existential inertia and classical theistic proofs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. They can also check out this amazing blog called The Majesty of Reason. <laughs> and let's see. Uh, they can check out this cool Phil People profile uh, by, by a person named Joseph C. Schmidt, which has a number of different papers on it. They are freely available and the person can read, which are on the topic of classical theism and metaphysics and so on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, I mean, as for as for like what books to read, what people to look into, look into the work of Gavin Kerr. I highly recommend his mm. stuff. Uh, look into, um, look into like this book is a natural companion book to Ed Fazer's Five Proofs of the Existence of God or Five Proofs of Five, five Proofs of God's Existence. Um, just pick them both up. Read Fazer's book first, then read this one second, and you'll get a very good sense of the debates going on in this sort of area with respect to classical theistic proofs. Um, let's see. Other things. Um, well, I, I guess one thing that people who are interested in divine timelessness could check out is The End of the Timeless God by Dr. Brian Mullins. Mm. Um, that's another thing. Um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to shout out people from both sides. So anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I'll just leave it at that. Yes, uh, thank you. And I'll, I'll, I'll link all of Joe's work below. Um, I would highly recommend you check out Joe's YouTube channel. Yeah, I'm especially. incredibly, I'm incredibly averse to self promotion, as you can see. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. No, no, you should be promoting it. It's uh, you put out some absolutely fantastic content. Ultimately, like here's the thing: like I'm really trying to help people. Like that's why I'm so mm -hmm. excited to try to get this out to people. It's mm -hmm. not so that I can like you know, toot my own horn or say I'm so like amazing or anything like that. No, no. Uh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I'm just trying to find the truth and I'm trying my hardest. Um, and I'm trying to help others get to the truth as well. And that's what I'm so passionate about. That's why I have my YouTube channel because I want to help others get to the truth and I want to help them think critically. So that's really why I'm promoting all this stuff is because I made it to help people. And the way that I help more people is to promote it. Right. Yeah. So um, that's really what I'm trying to do. Right. Well, thank you again, Joe, for joining me. I, I really appreciated the conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me on.